Independent Publisher Awards and has been- I uh, just want to, on behalf of Berkeley High, the Berkeley Public Library and Berkeley in general, welcome you here uh, virtually, Evie. And uh, I'm so excited about your no new book, Punching the Air, that we're going to be talking about today. And can you just uh, get us started by, for everyone out there who may not have read the book, for students who may not have done their homework, um, just tell us a little bit about the story. Um, and then uh, we'll talk next about your collaborator. Thank you, Aya. Hello, B Berkeley high school, right? And Berkeley Public Library. I've been to Berkeley and this is where I met Aya at the Vona Voices of Our Nation Arts Writing Workshop. And we were there 10 years ago. <laughs> 10 years ago. And um, this was one of the many stops along my writing journey, along my trying to become a published author journey. And um, I'm glad this is um, somewhat of a full circle. Uh, so yes, Punching the Air is my latest book. I wrote it with Exonerated Five member Youssef Salam. And he is, he is formerly the member of the Central Park Five and part of uh, that infamous Central Park jogger case that took place in 1989, a long time ago when he was 15 years old. Um, long story short, I don't mean to shorten it, but um, it's a very important story and it is an American story. Uh, five teens were tried and convicted for a crime they did in, that they did not commit. Uh, a woman was sexually assaulted in Central Park and there were a lot of kids out, um, out in the park that evening, um, but the police had to do their job and round up several uh, young people, boys who were said to be in the park and they questioned them to no end and they focused on five young men and questioned them for hours and hours. Um, they did not eat. Maybe they had a soda or two, had a little bit of water um, and four of those five young men were coerced into um, writing false confessions. The only person who did not write a false confession was Yusef Salam, and it's because his mother came to get him from the precinct, and she knew that that was against the law. Those false confessions were the only things that convicted them. There were no, there were no eyewitnesses. There were no true eyewitnesses. Their, um, their accounts of what happened that evening were not corroborating, and, um, and there was no DNA evidence. They each served their full term, except for Corey Wise, who um, almost served 13 years of his sentence. And they all served their time. And a few years after they were released, the true assailant came forward and said, I did it, I did it alone. And DNA evidence proved that he did it alone. And it, the, they were eventually exonerated and sued New York City. Where I come into the story is, of course, I didn't participate in any of it. I wasn't involved in the case at all, but it was a huge story in New York City at the time. It was everywhere and I was in the sixth grade. <laughs> so imagine being in the sixth grade and hearing about rape for the first time and hearing the words sexual assault and seeing those pictures of those young men, those boys in the newspaper and looking around at your classmates and wondering, could they do something that terrible? And I remember, you know, uh, I remember the boys used to have the flat tops and to me, they were the cutest boys. If you had a flat top, you were cute to me. And the boys had the flat tops and the, the boys in the Central Park Dogger case had their flat tops. They looked like the boys in my classroom and in my neighborhood, but they were accused of such a heinous crime. And I started to look at them a little differently because at the time, many of us believed that maybe they were guilty. Um, maybe the, the system can't get it wrong, right? I met Youssef later on in college, but after he um, served his sentence, he came back to college trying to finish his education. I'm um, trying to, no, not even finish, trying to get more education. And he came looking for a professor, a radical professor by the name of Dr. Marimba Ani, who was former Black Panther Party member, former SNCC member and she was teaching a course 
and in walks Youssef. And I wanted to interview him for my college's newspaper. We ended up talking, talking and walking um, to Harlem. And that's when the thing that he talked the most about was the man who he feels respo was responsible for his conviction. And that man was Donald Trump. Um, so we were talking about Donald Trump in 1999. I think that was the longest conversation I've ever had about <laughs> Donald Trump. And I ran into him again and I was so upset that he was selling his self-published book of poetry. And this was before the When They See Us series came out. And I thought it was so unfair that he was um, self-published when publishers were paying people to tell their stories. And he deserved you know, to be compensated for his story. He deserved um, his story to be out there. Uh, so, and I was already a young, young adult author. I wasn't sure if I was the one to tell that story, but he insisted that I tell it with him because I'm a mother and he needs, a, he said he wanted a woman's perspective because he could not have gone through what he went through without the help of his mother and his sister. And he was surrounded by women. So that's the long and short of it. Can you tell us a little bit about the book itself? I know when I opened it up, I was sort of expecting a historical novel set in the 90s, but instead you've kind of gone a different way with some of the same emotional truth, but it's set up a little differently. Can you say a little bit more about the book itself? So at the time when we decided to work together, he could not legally tell his story because he had signed the contract over to Ava DuVernay, who was at that time working on When They See Us. So in Hollywood, um, you know, when you are working on a story, you don't want any other competition. So um, I guess, you know, they were like, you know, Ava and Ava's people were like, we'll pay you, but you cannot go sell a book. <laughs> you cannot make a movie with someone else. So that was why we couldn't tell his particular story at that time. The movie had not come out yet. Uh, so we were given the green light to tell a fictional story using those same beats, but Youssef decided not to make it the same crime. And even some of the other experiences, um, Amal. Amal is a fictional character that's based on 16 year old Youssef. And Amal is incarcerated for a crime that he did not commit. Um, it wasn't even a wrong place, wrong time because the incident happened in his neighborhood in the same way that the incident happened across the street from where Youssef lived. And, and he was sent to jail and it, it, we didn't want it to be about the crime or courtroom drama. We wanted, to be, we wanted it to be an emotional journey of how this boy um, who is an artist and poet contends with what has ha ha what has happened to him and what is happening to him and what is going to happen to him and how he finds his voice and resolve through art and poetry because this is exactly what Youssef did. Um, at that, that night of that fateful event, he was wearing a pair of light colored pants that he still shows. If you look up some YouTube um, interviews, you'll see him hold up the pants that he was wearing that fateful night and they're not dirty at all. There are no stains on them at all. And that, it, it, it mind, it's mind boggling that that wasn't brought up as evidence, right? If the victim lost all this blood, why isn't it on his pants? Um, so the, the pants were covered in artwork. He had drawn um, drew on them and they were patchworks. And you remember Aya, we used to draw on our pants. Um, it was 1989. If it would like, if it was one or two years later, he probably would have had a black Bart Simpson on those pants. But because it was 1989, I think he had a Nefertiti on there, and a Bob Marley and a red, black, and green um, Africa on it. So it was covered in artwork. And you, if you know anything about young people, you're you're looking at this boy like, wow, you are incredibly creative, right? would you be capable of such a heinous crime? And the person who did do it was several years older than them, you know, and acted alone. Uh, so about Amal in the book did not participate in that sort of crime. We wanted it to be accessible to most teens where most teens, most people get into fights, right? Sometimes what if something happens and it ends up being almost fatal, right? And fights are, 
in the heat of a moment. And this was Yusef's idea of talking about boyhood, where you can easily get caught up in the heat of a moment and your life can change within a split second. And that's exactly what happens to Amal. His life changes just with one blow, right? And and he is it he has to spend time. And what does he do with that time and that um you know, time for reflection and thinking about what he did. Mm -hmm. I want to say, uh, I want to ask you to say a little bit more about something you talked about um, in an interview that you did with Dr. Youssef Salam on the Minorities in Publishing podcast with Jen Baker. You talked about how part of the core of this book connected to what you were just talking about was about emotional intelligence and emotional oh. literacy, how Amal finds a way to understand um, how his emotions have played out um, in his earlier life and then how he has to figure out how to manage them behind bars. Can you say a little bit more about that? Right, I, yeah, this is a story about emotional intelligence and I truly believe emotional intelligence is all about how we are able to articulate our feelings. And it goes beyond being able to say I'm angry or I'm sad or I'm happy. It's understanding why do I feel that way? It's grappling with those demons, so to speak, um, outside of um, the jail cell. He is able to roam free. And because he is free, he has to contend with emotions on a daily basis. And it's probably not in a healthy way um, I think there's not that I think there is one scene where he walks out in the, on the teacher, right? Um, because he's frustrated. He knows he's frustrated, but he doesn't have those tools to deal with that frustration in that moment. So he walks out. Um, he gets into a fight and he's also frustrated at the fact that there are these new people in his neighborhood and they're claiming the turf, but he's been there all along. And who are these people to dare to be able to do that? So in that sense, free Amal is dealing with a lot of emotions and they're going unchecked, but the only way he can deal with those emotions is being free within his body, right? He can throw a punch or he could walk away, right? He can, um, if it's, there's a part where he's describing the walls in his house or feel like they're closing in on him but he could walk away, he could walk out and go on a skateboard and be free. But being incarcerated where, where the walls are literally closing in on you, you can't go anywhere. So he is forced to turn inward, right? Um, and he can't punch anything. And that's where the title comes from, punching the air. Like, he, you know, there are walls, there are not people, you know, to be violent in that setting would be incredibly detrimental so he is forced to go in, right? And pull on some sort of creativity to let it all out. Mm -hmm. One of the other things that I remember you saying in that interview that really compelled me was you were talking about how um, young people, particularly young people of color, because of racism and the other things that we face, mean that we need to develop an analysis, sort of a political analysis of the conditions of our lives. And then sometimes when we have one, you know, we're seen as so brilliant, but actually it's sort of by necessity. Um, I remember when I went to Berkeley High, I also was a young person who had a political analysis and a lot of my teachers encouraged me to have one. But sometimes when I would go out in the world, adults, particularly white adults would be like, I'm so surprised that you have critical thinking skills. Can you say a little bit more about that? It felt like there was some kind of low expectation of me as a black girl. So this book, the idea for how the book is written, it's written in verse um, in sort of spoken word poetry, started with seeing Yusef's poetry that he had written while he was incarcerated. And he the, the self-published book that he was selling, um, opened with um, a poem that he later told me that he recited when he was 16 years old, right after he had received his conviction. Uh, and the words, the wordplay, the information in that poem at 16 
I say wise beyond his years, right? But then what you just um, said, I, uh, I think it's true. We were forced to be critically aware of our um, surroundings. And when Yusuf and I talk about this poem, we just remember the time that it was in around that time where hip hop had a message. He says this, you know, where you're forced to listen to the lyrics and hear a political message, hear a cultural message, because that was um, the Zykus, right? KRS One was saying something. Um, uh, uh, X Clan was more radical. Even Queen Latifah was talking about feminism at that time. So we were sort of repeating what we were hearing and think cri thinking critically about what we were going through. But it was the hip hop at the time, the music at the time that echoed what we were experiencing. And we were able to say, okay, we're not crazy. We're, we are we are seeing what we're seeing and KRS says, one says so, right? And all these other um, hip hop artists who were political in their message said so. Chuck D, KRS one, yeah. KRS one, public enemy and all of them. Yeah, now I'm curious, did you all think about setting it at the time? Was that a debate or did you just know from the beginning you wanted it to be a contemporary book? We did want it to be a contemporary. When we realized that we could be a fictional story, um, we had to move it away, as far away from his true story as we could. So Amal is a 2020 version of uh, um, uh, Youssef, where what would be like, a, you know, if he was conscious back in 89, what's a conscious kid now? He's a, well, he's politically aware. He, you know, he understands um, the 13th Amendment and can make those connections between feeling enslaved and the loophole in our American constitutions. So there are kids like that. There are kids who are reading critically and thinking critically about racial justice and social justice. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, one of the things that I think that's so powerful is, you know, given the conditions of racism, the conditions of the prison industrial complex, you know, the conditions of police violence, unfortunately, which is why the movement for Black Lives and other movements for um, abolition movements are, are fighting so hard is that the same story that took place in 1989 could have taken place today or in 1969, you know, like we see that continuity. So I, um, I think we have some questions uh, coming from students and audience members. So we wanna open it up or make that transition to questions from the audience. Are we ready? Yes, I am ready. Hello, hello. Um, okay, so I'm so excited to see both of you here. This is really, really wonderful. Um, and I, um, um, I do have a few questions from audience members. Um, what was your creative process like writing uh, this book together? Zakia, first I wanna acknowledge that we are sisters. I know, it's so insane. <laughs> your, is, your last name is better than mine because you got that extra za on there. Right, right, right. That's right. a boy. Well, I was that, you know, but yeah, when I saw you there, I was like, oh my God. And I have glasses like yours too. And I was like, oh my God. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. Yeah, I love this, love this. <laughs> so you're Ms. Zaza, Zaza, how do you pronounce it? Yeah. Um, that, I'm Miss Zazaboy and my, my name is Liberian. I'm, my father's from Liberia. My husband is from Liberia. Gosh! That's where the last name comes come from. Let's go, let's go. That's where oh. his last name comes from. See, it's you're all watching this happen oh. live. Like long <laughs> lost African heritage family finding themselves. Sorry, right. guys. Okay, my creative. Yes. <laughs> wow, that's deep. That's so deep. And you um, know, yeah, when I see names like that, I'm like, I got, especially if I see something who has the last name dad's boy, I'm like, oh, I, maybe my dad have a few more. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, this is my, <laughs> um, my husband's last name. 
Um, oh, so my creative process was, was listening to Yusef talk and talk. Yusef can talk a lot. Yusef would, he would talk about not what happened to him. He would reflect on why it happened, right? Mm. I think, I don't, you know, I don't know if he's been through, th I don't, he hasn't been through therapy, but talking about it is therapy, but he talks about it like right. a preacher would, like I made it through something hellish and this is how I survived. So when in talking to him about the story, it was less about what happened next or what happened next. It was more about, you know, like I never got into a fight. You know, he told me how he never got into a fight in prison and we had to make that up for the story so that it's a compelling and more uh, a story that um, can compass his real experiences. So I would listen to him and I would take bits of what he said and write the poems around it. So I wrote mm. the poems. There are five or six poems that are from his um, collection in there. And we couldn't use every, some of them are a little rough, you know, we couldn't use everything. <laughs> but um, the parts where Amal, um, is reciting poetry when he's rhyming and spitting, those are Yusef's a, a, um, actual words. So I wrote the poems based on things that Yusef would tell me, like um, it's stories about his mother and how his mother was present and how he had a little girlfriend, you know, and what it felt like um, just trying to connect to his father and what that felt like. Um, I made up like the other, we made up the characters like the prison ward, um, and the teachers there, um, one of the teachers is based on a, like a activist slash poet, um, Lisa Jesse Peterson, um, who worked at Rikers. So all of those things, you know, we made up, but they're from a little bit from his experience. What, what was the emotion, the emotional part comes from Yousef, because I had to ask, mm -hmm. how did it feel? How did it feel every step of the way? And I don't know, I could only assume this might have happened. I feel like it happens to me a lot, especially with friends of mine who are brilliant writers. Were the, oops, sorry. Were there exchanges where um, he would explain something to you and then you would re, like, reword it, just like a little, you put a little of, of your jazz on it. He's like, yes, oh my God. Like, how did you even know how to do that? <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is Mr. Zoboy. This is Mr. Wow. Zoboy. She's my from Liberia. Yeah, my father's from Liberia. Yeah. What part? My, yeah. Um, he uh, he is from uh, Moravia. From Moravia. Yeah. And we yeah. Have, yeah we have land out there. I've been out there a few times. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I call it's probably, it's probably, baby, it's probably my mom, pronounced my the same it. way, but we just spell yeah. it the same way. Mm -hmm. Right, right. <laughs> ask, him <laughs> if you're from, ask him if you're from Bong County. <laughs> Yeah, we have, yeah, he, from from Bonga, too, yeah. Genealogy happened. We thought it was just language. Yeah. This is also ge genealogy. Genealogy happened. We wow. didn't even know. We still have right. family in Bonga. Well, I'm 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 right. I just yeah. wanted him right. to sorry, say sorry. hi to his family. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So we are related. And what was the story? <laughs> oh, no, I was just asking, there, you, there may have not been any moments, but I just can only imagine you work, two working together and him ex explaining stuff to you and then um, you rewording it and his, his like expression or his, his being like so enthusiastic about the way that you were able to take something that he said and put it into this very powerful like a, a way where it was like, yes, that's exactly what I was trying to say. Um, how, did, how did you do that? Uh, it's intuiting, like it's, it's, um... I don't know. It is like a mind meld a little bit because um, I'm not a guy. I'm not a man. I'm not a 16 year old boy. But I think that is part of the writing. The writing process is to really empathize with what it mm, yeah. might have been like. And and it's not just that or on in a, in a practical way. I grew up in New York City and I grew up on hip hop. At a, from a certain time, you know, and we were un, inundated with that male voice telling you what how they feel, you know. I know um, DMX just passed away, but I listened to DMX, and you could, you know, 
you listen to his feelings all the time. And I, you know what? I could write a DMX ROM because I listen to it. But just um, when I was, he, when I would hear Yusef rhyme and he would read his poetry like he's rhyming, I was like, I remember the boys in my <laughs> class talking like that, the boys in my neighborhood talking like that. And I just mimic it, you know, I mimic that cadence. Um, and it's just, it's from listening. And I, I think that's why we're part of being writers, Aya. We, we listen, we listen and we right. observe. I love that. Um, I have another, can you um, tell us more about the role of Miss Romaldi? Um, is that a real person? I, and honestly, when I first opened the book, that's immediately what I cried about. So I almost thought I probably might have done that too, even as like, you know, a, a emotionally aware as I am, where he's like, she doesn't know me. Um, she doesn't know nothing about me. All she knows is like this artwork and that's all she's ever uh, waiting, weighing in as my value. And it just like hit me. I was like, oh, dang, like, I hope I'm not doing that. Um, and like, I, I wouldn't necessarily ask you, like, can you give us some feedback on how to avoid doing that? That's not fair. Um, but yeah, was, is, is this a real person? Um, what does her role say about teachers just in public classrooms today? And, you know, like, yeah, obviously it's a very dangerous thing for teachers to be separating a student's work, art, um, their writing from their full being. Um, but that was a very, just uh, that, that relationship really hit me. So Miss Rinaldi is based on a real person and a real interaction that I was having. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> not and not in the class. I've seen versions of her in the classroom, but in the moment, in the time that I was writing that, um, my son was in the seventh grade, and I still have those emails um, from his art teacher. Um, my son was not feeling well one day and I know he was like coughing and not feeling well at night, but he felt better that morning. So of course, um, and this was happening several nights. So by the time he has art in the afternoon, he's tired. So he'll do his work with his hood on laying down. Um, and the teacher, when she wrote in me an email, it made it, she made it seem like he was being disrespectful um, she, she wrote the email in a way that she thought, um, would elicit anger from me and that my son would get in trouble. Right. You would see, you know, when teachers be like, I'm gonna call your mother, yep. you know, and, yep. <laughs> um, coming from certain teachers and when you know, your child doesn't behave, it's like, it works in one way. Right. In another way, like my, I'm advocating for my son. If I don't think you are portraying him in the fair light, I'm on his side. So in her, like she wrote him to be like another, is that my child you're asking? Like, okay, this is my son. Like, right. this is Zuberi. Are you describing Zuberi? Um, and I had to go meet with her and I'm like, no, he's not feeling well. Did you ask him how he was feeling? He wasn't being disrespectful. He was tired, you know, because she did say he, you know, he's he's never acted like this before. Now he's being influenced by his friends. No, he's tired. <laughs> so in that sense, that is kind of profiling, you know, you're profiling. And I know mm -hmm. there are kids who don't don't um, express themselves the same way in the classroom. Uh, but still, you find out what's going on, you know, first and foremost, ask them first, why are you putting your head down, you know, you don't right, she didn't right. believe him, she didn't believe that he was tired, like you, like the child can't get tired, so yeah, so I added a little bit more of those, like, teachers who mean well, but they end up doing more damage than not. <laughs> Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I really, I really did feel that, which you know explains more of just the the wonderful writer that you are. It did feel very, very personal. Um, I have another question from the panel. Um, maybe I can give you two questions. You can choose which one you want to answer if that works for you. Um, so one is this is obviously a story that draws from Yusuf's life experiences, but uh, what did it bring up for you? How did it impact you emotionally? And another one is um, um, what role do you see for stories and books in addressing some of the racism in our society? 
Okay, I can so, repeat those two. Oh, okay. okay. So the first one, for me, I'm writing, I was co-writing with Yousef as a woman, as a mother, um, but I was pulling on my memories of being a teen and being a 12 year old first and foremost, seeing the Central Park Five on TV and in my classroom. My classroom, because my teacher used to bring a, would bring newspapers into the classroom. And I know you, you all had to do that. We had to do current events and the five W's and cut out the article, put it in a little loose paper, loose leaf paper, turn it over, who, what, when, where, and why. Um, and from April up until April of my sixth grade to the end of sixth grade, the Central Park jogger case was on the news, in the newspaper and on the news every single day. Um, so I am writing from that 12 year old self who's trying to contend with like, wait, what did they do? <laughs> um, and then I'm writing from my 16 year old self who had boyfriends, right? Um, who were, who became incarcerated. There is something called the Rockefeller drug laws where, you know, my friends, uh, my boyfriends would have a little dime bag in their pockets and get caught and you know, they're out in Rikers for three years, you know, <laughs> and now, you know, marijuana is legal um, in many states, but they lost years of their lives for something that seems so arbitrary now because it's no longer the law. So I'm remember, and before I met Youssef, I met him um, in spring, April of 1999. In February of 1999, a man by the name of Amadou Diallo, you remember him, Aya, um, was shot 41 times by police, an Af West African immigrant, and that was right there in New York City. So when I was like a riled up little journalist, you know, and then when I met Youssef, I'm like, I'm gonna get your story because I know they, you know, he wasn't exonerated yet. And we knew that, yeah, I know you didn't do it because look at you here in college. Um, he was wearing a little pea coat. Um, so I'm bringing my activist self, myself as a, a girlfriend and a friend and a neighbor and a student watching these things happen around to the boys. And this is just one book. I write about the things that happen to girls and women as well. Um, but uh, I'd be wrong to say that what happens to the boys around me did not affect me as well because they were, they are. They have mothers, they have cousins, sisters, girlfriends, classmates who were all impacted by what happened to them. And um, social justice books for teens. Man, listen, I wish I had a novel like um, this when I was a teen. 1999, Monster came out, um, but I was already in college, but in high school, things were happening in the world and we didn't talk about it in the classroom at all. The Rodney King case happened. Um, Rodney King happened to, um, was happening when I was in the ninth and 10th grade. And we saw it in the news and we'd come back to the classroom like as business as usual. I remember they closed, you know, they closed school, school shut down because, ooh, people gonna riot. <laughs> and, and then you come back and it's just like, okay, we're, we're just not gonna talk about this. And nobody thought to talk, talk about it. Um, sexual harassment was on the news with Anita Hill um, and nobody talked about it. So things were happening in our world that never um, filtered into the classroom. You know, I had to like watch Rodney King and all these other racial violences happening. And then we're reading Macbeth in the classroom, right? <laughs> and then even in college, just experiencing all these other things and then having to read Jane Eyre, you know, <laughs> or Wuthering Heights in my feminist um, feminism classroom. So yeah, so books, I wish these books were around and I'm glad young people have these books now. And my job is to take his, the, our present moment and take what I've learned and take what I want you to learn and put them into books. Mm -hmm. I just want to jump in and say, you know, because we have a lot of Berkeley High School students here that, you know, even way back in my day, um, I'm close in age to EB, um, Berkeley High was definitely much more on the cutting edge in terms of political education. Um, first of all, social living, um, which uh, I believe was started by Nancy Rubin in the late 70s, is an incredible resource. Like I remember 
the kinds of conversations that I've had with my contemporaries about what their sex education was, as opposed to my sex education, I'm just shocked at, you know, what sex education looked like in other parts of the country in the 80s, let alone in other countries, you know, so it's really, there have been a lot of fights here in Berkeley to have that kind of information accessible to young people, LGBTQ friendly social living, sex positive social living, but also politically like Berkeley High School has, you know, had an African American studies department now has ethnic studies. Even way back in the day, there was like African American literature being taught by black faculty there. So, you know, we are very fortunate and Berkeley has its challenges, right? And and also just the literature then, like I see shout outs to uh, Walter Dean Myers in the chat, but like they're just, you know, nowadays there's just much more rich, diverse young adult literature. It's not as diverse as it needs to be, but compared to what it was 10, 20, 30 years ago, it's really exploded and given us literature to share with young people as an opportunity, not just to learn the history, but also to follow characters through story, right? Which is why we write fiction about this because those stories really grab us. And, you know, I guess one of the questions that I would ask you, Evie, was like, what, you know, as the writer, like, were there heartbreaking moments when you were writing this story? I know sometimes when I write, like if it's a really heavy scene, I'll be feeling it. I'm just wondering where were some of those places for you? Um, the stomps, stomp squad, stomp squad. Um, the fighting scenes. Uh, I had to, I'm glad that it's written in po poems because you don't have to add too many details to it, but I had to really get into the violence of it all. I mean, I don't present a certain way because some people question like, did you write those scenes or did you say, I wrote those scenes because um, I'm from like New York City. So <laughs> so it's right, come pulling from some somewhere else because Yusef did not experience that sort of violence, um, that the violence on the page, um, those were hard. Um, they're always hard, not because I can't do it, but because I have to, what does it feel like when you're angry, when you're enraged? And I can only think of the color red. I'm, I have kids in the yard. Red or like thinking of a volcano, just using metaphors for anger and rage. Um, and I'm glad I was able to lean on poetry to describe those hard scenes. That's a good question. Thank you. Yeah, I'll turn it back that. over to you, Zakia. Okay, yeah. I, I, I'm, I, there's so many questions to ask. But I guess um, I always love to leave with like, some advice, uh, which is great. Um, but yeah, do you have any recommendations or, or which authors are you loving to read right now? Um, what's on your, your, your list to make yourself even more bomb and great and glorious? All the Black authors writing today um, uh, are on my list. Uh, there are those in the forefront and then there are those in the background. The quieter stories deserve some light too. Um, quieter stories from Renee Watson or Brandy Colbert. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, of course, I'm, I'm sure you're all reading Jason Reynolds and Angie Thomas. Um, it's to give um, young people a range, a breadth and depth of story. Um, Latinx authors like um, like um, Elizabeth Acevedo and Lilium Rivera. Um, I, there are plenty more. I know I'm <laughs> uh, Zoraida Cordava, Cordava, right? Um, yeah. So there, we are like, there's a momentum now, there's a sea change, there's a movement. Um, I'm part of an anthology of Latinx authors. Um, I'm, I'm from a Latin country because French is a Latin country. <laughs> uh, France is a Latin speaking romance language that colonized Haiti, but I don't call myself Afro-Latina. Um, it's a black country, but I write, wrote an essay about that in, um, wild tongues un cannot be tamed. Uh, so yeah, we are out here doing it. 
Um, it's not a lot comparatively speaking, but it's more than what I had. Oh, you're oh, being... Thank you so much. It was lovely talking to both of you and hearing from both of you. I'm not sure who's going to close it out, but you know, that was really nice. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much. This has been such a fantastic event. Um, I just want to thank the Friends of the Berkeley Public Library for sponsoring this event. Thank you so much to the librarians at Berkeley High School. Cannot do this without you. Zakia, thank you so much for participating. It's been so great meeting you. Aya, so lovely meeting you. Thank you so much. And Evie Zaboy, thank you so much for being a part of this series. And we look thank forward you. to hopefully working with you again. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, so Aya. Much. Thank you for doing this. Oh, thanks for inviting me. This was a blast. Go Berkeley High. Yeah. Jacket. Yeah. Thank you, cousin. <laughs> oh, awesome. see you soon. Please reach out to me on social media. I got to introduce you I to your nephews and nieces and stuff. I we'll find the connection. Yeah. We'll find the connection. Got to. Okay. <laughs> Right. Thank on. you, Aya. Thank you, Berkeley Public Library and Berkeley High School. Yes. Go. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Bye.